Please stand for the gospel reading. Our gospel this morning comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they dis discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. be seated.
It's a strange thing how authority works in our world. A person can be raised into a manager's position at work or become a leader in a political office with great fanfare and promise. And all our hopes and expe expectations get poured into this person to improve a business or a nation or an organization. But as you likely know, the will of the people can sour just as quickly on their new leader. Unless folks like what they see, they tend to get impatient. They begin to see some flaws. They find someone else they like, like better. They're like pre-adolescent school children with a new crush. But it's not only the fickleness of crowds that affects the success or failure of leaders. In fact, it's very often something else that plays the primary role. And that is the internal state of the leader himself. A leader, after all, can very often soldier on even when he is unpopular. Again, you may know some examples of this from personal experience. But if he is to do so, he must have a clear conscience and a clear head about what he is doing. He must have a vision for the future. For the moment that vision is compromised, the moment he loses his confidence, he is done for. The Bible shows us a contrast between these two, two types of leadership in the books of Joshua and Judges. For those of you who have read these two books, you will have noticed that Joshua is a fairly straightforward book. At the very beginning, God tells Joshua that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to give them. And of course, that is exactly what happens. Joshua was the obedient leader. He had the confidence of the people and a clear vision of what God had tasked, tasked him with. The book of Judges, on the other hand, by its very name, hints at the fact that it was not a time of consistency and stability. There wasn't a single leader like Joshua shepherding the people into the promised land. But instead, we have a whole host of leaders or judges who arise. And though they do provide some temporary leadership to Israel, they were far from ideal, far from perfect. Perhaps most famously among them, we have Samson, the strong man, who we know was quite capable in battle. He slew 3,000 Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. But his desire for Delilah compromised him. It distracted him and ultimately led to his downfall. Unlike Joshua, he couldn't keep a clear-eyed vision of God's future. Instead, he was a divided man who failed to provide Israel with the leadership they needed. Our gospel text for today develops further this theme of leadership and authority not so much through explicit teachings, but rather through the actions of Jesus. As we see him interact with those around him, Jesus provides a model for spiritual leadership in our world. Now, before we get to that, I want to first provide some context for our text. The interaction between Jesus and the chief priests over the issue of authority doesn't arise simply by chance. But rather, this showdown comes on the heels of Jesus' grand entrance into Jerusalem. The beginning of this chapter, chapter 21, is actually the text we traditionally read on Palm Sunday. Jesus enters Jerusalem with great excitement. And we have the palm branches, and he's sitting on the donkey, and the people are shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. 
The whole city was stirred. And this grand entrance is closely followed by another famous incident in Jesus' career, and that is his cleansing of the temple, the casting out of the money changers and the animals. And so in our text for today, when Jesus enters the temple courts, there is a reason why the chief priests wish to interrogate him. They want to know how Jesus can enter the city like a king, how he, how he can suddenly make judgments about the temple and begin teaching the people and teaching with authority. He was an upstart from Galilee. This was their territory. Maintaining the temple was their prerogative. And so it was natural for them to ask how this was all possible. Now, as I previously mentioned, we don't hear Jesus teaching explicitly on the matter. Rather, it's through his actions and this whole chapter that Jesus models spiritual authority for us. But if there is a teaching that sort of summarizes what we see in the text, I think we can look to Jesus' advice to his disciples as he sends them out to announce the kingdom. There he says to them, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. If we look at Jesus' actions in our text, we see that his approach involves both an awareness of power and the intentions of those around him, but also a firm, confident resolve and an uncompromised conscience. He has both wisdom and innocence. And so as we unpack our text, I want to use this phrase, wise as serpents and innocent as doves, to help clarify what we see happening as Jesus enters the scene in Jerusalem. The chapter, as I already mentioned, begins with that famous Palm Sunday scene. And what we see here is that Jesus is quite aware of his role. It was Jesus, after all, that told his disciples to go find the donkey he was to ride in on. He knew he was fulfilling scripture. He knew he was taking on a royal office by entering the city the way he did. And when the people acclaim him king, he does not tell them to be quiet or to downplay the importance of what was happening. Instead, he widely uses this entrance to frame his identity and mission. He claims the authority of King David. And it's likely he also knew that this type of entrance would cause some conflict with the priestly class. And of course, this type of maneuvering, if we can call it that, takes a good deal of wisdom. Now, of course, Jesus throughout maintains his innocence. He does not let this popularity, this power control him. He does not lead a people's rebellion. Instead, he looks to serve God. And so he goes immediately to the temple. And what does he find there? But a gang of men who have turned God's house into a market, into a bazaar. And so he clears the temple. But here again, it's the words of scripture that motivate our Lord, not power. For Jesus quotes the prophets to the moneylenders saying, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Jesus throughout acts with both wisdom the wisdom that comes from God's word, but also with innocence and purity. 
Now, if we consider for a moment the money lenders, we see a clear contrast. These men show that they were indeed not innocent. For if they believed that they were in the right, they may have refused to leave. They would have resisted Jesus. In fact, they may have tried to quote scripture themselves. They may have tried to claim that they were serving God after all, that they were making it easier for folks far away to offer an animal for sacrifice in the temple. But of course, whatever honorable intentions they might have claimed, there was more of greed and irreverence in their behavior. They knew that Jesus was right to do what he did, and their consciences did not give them the courage to stand. And so they were driven out. Here we should remember the wise words of Solomon in the book of Proverbs where he says that the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. When our conscience convicts us, even the slightest opposition will cause us to head for the hills. But when our conscience is clear, we become immovable. If we turn now to our text for today, we may grant that the chief priests and elders were, on the one hand, wise, at least in a shrewd, worldly sense. They knew that Jesus was more than a mere preacher from Galilee, that he was claiming real authority. And in one sense, it was not necessarily bad for them to question Jesus. They were the religious authorities. They did have leadership roles, God-given roles. They were to shepherd the people and take care of the temple. But as we see in the text, they were not innocent. When Jesus responds to their question about authority with his own question about John the Baptist, they deliberate not as faithful shepherds, but rather as those only concerned with power and how to keep it. They say to themselves, well, if we say that John's baptism was from God, then we will be asked why we didn't believe. And if we say it was from man, then, well, we're afraid of the crowd. And so, of course, they say that they do not know. They choose a cowardly response. They show that their hearts are not innocent or sincere. Now, if we look at Jesus during this engagement, we see something very different. On the one hand, Jesus here does act wisely. He knows that to that the chief priests are not being honest. They're not inquisitive seekers. This is not like Jesus' encounter with the Pharisee Nicodemus, where Nicodemus seems to have a genuine interest in Jesus and his message. No, these were the same people that rejected John the Baptist. And Jesus' ministry was the culmination or fulfillment of John. And so Jesus knows that they're not being honest and that their hearts are not open. And because of this, Jesus isn't required to answer them directly. Indeed, our Lord told us not to cast our pearls before swine. But Jesus does, in fact, pursue the dialogue, but carefully. He does this by responding to the chief priests in the form of another question. And this was, in fact, a fairly common pattern used by rabbis in order to have a discussion. It was a way of saying things, but in a way that sort of elevated the discussion, that added an artistic poetic element to it. And so by asking the chief priests about John, Jesus 
isn't trying to change the subject. He's not being evasive. Rather, in doing so, he's connecting his authority to that of John. He's saying that the authority and mission that God had given to John was the same authority by which he was doing what he was doing. And so those with ears to hear, including the chief priests, surely would have picked up on this fact. It's really quite a masterful engagement when you look at it. Jesus displayed both wisdom and innocence as he assumed the authority that God had given him. And the contrast of both the moneylenders in the temple and the chief priests show us what it looks like to act with a sinful heart, what it looks like to lead with a bad conscience. Now this is all well and good. Just be like Jesus then. Not like those nasty sinners. Be wise and innocent. Be like Joshua, don't be like Samson. It's not that easy, though. And as Pat said, there is, seems to be three categories at play um, in our text. If it was that easy, we'd all be doing it just like our Lord Sin always seems to find a way to undermine our best intentions. And so it's important that I th- then I think to hear our Lord's words, to be wise and innocent, but to hear them in the context of being a sinner. The second half of our gospel text points the way forward. Here we hear a story about two sons One who says he'll do what his father asks, but does not do it. And the other who refuses to obey, but ends up obeying in the end. Now we can be like those who say that they will obey, and yet our behavior says otherwise. And if this is the case, we will be like the chief priests and the scribes. Though we might think something of ourselves, we lack the spiritual authority to be God's people in this world. We will stand by cowardly. We will find ourselves unable to answer the questions that are posed to us. But there is another option. A third way, another option has been opened to us. And this is the way of Repentance. John re- preached repentance. And as we see in this text, this message was received by those who thought that they were too far from God to enter his kingdom. But God has indeed brought them close. And he brings us close today as well. The way of repentance is always before us, always available. Martin Luther said that repentance isn't a one-time event, but rather all of life is to be one of repentance. When we repent, we face our sin honestly. We acknowledge freely that we have fallen short of what God wants for us. But instead of despairing, we remember that God has done the battle with sin, death, and the devil. And that God is supremely for us and not against us. And through faith in Christ, we receive all the gifts and righteousness that he has won. All those things that he rightly deserves. Hebrews 10 states, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And this is my 
prayer for each one of us today. Let us continually return to our baptisms, remembering that in Christ our Lord, we can have a clean conscience in spite of sin. And in this way, we regain our spiritual authority. We as his followers are under his headship. And so we need not run when the slightest opposition comes our way. We need not let our consciences make us fearful and cowardly. Instead, we remember that Christ has made us righteous and we can be as bold as lions. If God is bringing renewal to this world and we, and we believe that he is, then he calls his people to be a healing presence, a bold and confident presence in this world. When others are running on a guilty conscience, God calls us to stand firm, being as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Amen.